At one point in the operating rooms, when they were circumcising children, as soon as they were born, they were basically bleeding to death, and they couldn't understand why. Now God said to circumcise on the eighth day. Welcome to Foundational Bible Teachings. So I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's Bible study. We're continuing on our series, Who Wrote the Bible, God or Man? And tonight's going to be episode 7, point number 23. Circumcising on the eighth day. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 17 and verse 12. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. So God's giving a commandment now to Abraham and he had to circumcise himself as an old man, all the people of his house, all of the servants that he had, and all the children that were going to be born. But now there was a stipulation, only on the eighth day, not a day before and not a day after. And there's a reason for that. Now the way it's written in Genesis, he that is eight days old shall be circumcised and this is the commandment. God doesn't have to give any explanations. If you get into the habit where God says something, you understand what the commandment is, and you walk in that commandment, you will be blessed by it. Even though you you don't know what the mechanics of it is. So God told Abraham to circumcise males from the eighth day of life onward. The question asked was why? It was in October 24th, 1929 that the answer came about. Now Genesis, we're talking about Abraham. Abraham was 1890 BC, but it was only on October 24th, 1929 that the answer came. Danish biochemist Carl Peter Henrik Dam was awarded the 1943 Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology for his discovery of vitamin K, the blood coagulating factor. He shared the prize with the American biochemist Edward A. Dozy, who was born in 1893, died in 1986, elucidated the chemical nature of the vitamin. The discovery was of great importance because it advanced the understanding of blood coagulation and produced a new life-saving therapy for bleeding diseases. In 1935, Professor Henrik Dam proposed the name vitamin K. He called this vitamin K after the German word for coagulation. It's spelt with a K. So that's why he called it vitamin K. Now the human body has two blood clotting factors. One of them is called vitamin K. It's not formed in the body until the fifth to the seventh day of life. At one point in the operating rooms when they were circumcising children, as soon as they were born, they were basically bleeding to death and they couldn't understand why. Now God said to circumcise on the eighth day. The second factor which is necessary for clotting is called prothrombin. It's interestingly enough developed to 30% of normal by the third day of life and then with seeming inconsequence breaks at a peak of 110% on the eighth day before leveling off at 100% normal. It actually hits 110% only on the eighth day, not before and not after. So prothrombin is a plasma protein produced in the liver in the presence of vitamin K and converted into thrombin by the action of various activators in the clotting of blood. So it is with the fifth through the seventh day of the newborn's male's life that vitamin K produced by bacteria and the intestinal tract is present in adequate quantities. So vitamin K coupled with prothrombin causes blood coagulation which is important in any surgical procedure. So basically put, the eighth day represents the best time to perform the surgical intervention called circumcision. Both the vitamin K is present at its peak along with the prothrombin at 110% in the body to be able to coagulate or clot the blood after the surgery. Was Abraham explained by God about about the coagulating factors of vitamin K and the prothrombin? Absolutely not. He was just told to circumcise on the eighth day, period. And by faith, he did it. If man did write the Bible, he would have known about the peaking vitamin K and the prothrombin produced in the male body on the eighth day. But man only figured it out approximately 3,800 years later. Point number 24. What meats to eat or avoid? Turn to Leviticus chapter 11, verses 6 and 7. And the hare, which is a rabbit, because he cheweth the cud, but the divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the swine, though he divide the hoof and be cloven footed, yet he cheweth not the cud, he is unclean to you. Now, many years ago, my wife, Severia, she homeschooled our children. And one of the stories that she taught them was called Starving on Hair. And I happened to be home that day and she was reading this story and it just caught my attention. Now, food was scarce for the native Indians on a particular winter and hair was more than abundant in the fields. The more they ate of these rabbits, the more they were hungry and they couldn't understand 
understand what was happening. One thought that crossed my mind was, can it be that our bodies cannot digest certain meats? And that's where I started thinking of Leviticus. Now there is something called rabbit starvation. Rabbit starvation is also referred to as protein poisoning or mal de caribou in French. It is a form of acute malnutrition caused by excess consumption of any lean meat, example rabbit, coupled with a lack of other sources of nutrients, usually in combination with other stressors such as severe cold or dry environment. Symptoms include diarrhea, headaches, fatigue, low blood pressure, and a vague discomfort and an unstoppable hunger even after eating large amounts of that meat. Very similar to food craving that can only be satisfied by consumption of fat or carbohydrates. So you're going to need a mixture. Another site made an interesting comment on pork. Now I didn't have time to verify the claims, but basically they said this explains the high rate of rheumatism found in those who consume pork. How many people suffer from rheumatism? So if man wrote the Bible, he would definitely know the dangers of certain meats. It seems that he is still not sure about this subject, yet the Bible, as a fact, warns man and lays down what you can and cannot eat. Let's go to point number 25. What seafoods to eat or not to eat? Again, you're in Leviticus chapter 11. Look at verses 9 and 10. These shall ye eat of all that are in the waters. Whatsoever hath fins and scales in the waters, in the seas, and in the rivers, them shall ye eat. Fish. Skip. Exactly, fish. And all that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers, of all that move in the waters, and any of the living thing which is in the waters, they shall be an abomination to you. It's something that you're utterly going to detest. So before the advent of the internet, shelled seafoods and shrimps were prohibited by doctors due to their high content of cholesterol. One comment I've come across was, as with all seafood, shrimp is high in calcium and protein, but low in food energy. Now when it takes more energy to convert for the food that you eat for fuel for your body, your body is in the red. I'm eating something, my body has to work at it, but if it has to work and the energy that it's going to pump out is less than all the work it put in, you're basically in the negative. So also a comment made by the same site basically confused me. It said cholesterol from food is harmful only if it is absorbed by the body. I'm still trying to wrap my head around that one. Now if man wrote the Bible, he would follow his own advice on which seafood we can consume and not consume. Since he didn't write the Bible, Bible, he's still trying to figure it out. Point number 26, pads in the seas. The following is a story of a man that believed God and proved the Bible to be true. Matthew Fontaine Murray, born January 14th, 1806, died February 1st, 1873, was nicknamed Pathfinder of the Seas and father of modern oceanography and naval meteorology and later scientist of the seas. Due to the publication of the extensive works in his books, especially the physical geography of the sea of 1855, the first extensive and comprehensive book on oceanography to be published. Murray made many important new contributions to the charting winds and ocean currents, including ocean lanes for passing ships at sea. At one time, when Commodore Murray was sick, he asked one of his daughters to get the Bible and read to him. So she chose to read Psalm 8. The eighth verse of which speaks of whatever walketh through the pads of the sea. He repeated the pads of the sea, the pads of the sea, pads of the sea. If God said the pads of the sea, they are there. And if ever get out of this bed, I will find them. So he did begin his deep sea surrounding as soon as he was strong enough and found that two ridges extended from the New York coast to England. So he made charts for the ships to sail over one path to England and over another path when you're coming back from England to New York. So they're not crossing over the same water because all of a sudden now there's pads in the seas and he ended up discovering it. For 40 years, Murray labored to locate and chart the ocean's major currents. Turn to Psalm 8.8. This is the verse that he actually read. The fowl of the air and the fish of the sea and whatsoever passeth through the pads of the seas. Psalm 107 verses 23 and 24. They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. If man did write the Bible, he would have known about the pads of the seas thousands of years ago. Matthew Murray took God at his word and he actually found them. So I'm going to finish here for tonight. We're going to continue next week. I got a few more points that I'm going to be covering. If the Bible is right on some of these points, the Bible is also right that after we die, there is an eternity. And where you will spend eternity is where you decide to go. God does not throw anybody in hell. It's very important you understand that. Do you know what God did instead? He actually sent his son to actually die for our miserable lives. I have to include myself in there. So when he came and he hung on that cross, he took my sins and all of your sins. He hung them on his back and he died with them because we couldn't 
should pay for that debt. And now is the time that you make a decision. Like it says in Romans chapter 10 verse 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe from your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you confess, the word if, it's actually working on your choice. It's something that you have to do of your own mind, of your own heart, coming from your soul. God will never push anybody into salvation. Jesus came, he died, and it's a gift. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. The thing about the works, it just erases so many religions, so many cults off the map. Because God says, it is a gift that I want to give you. If your good works can actually get you to heaven, why did Jesus Christ have to die on that cross. Now you say, I want nothing to do. And God says, not a problem. He says, you know what, Lord? You give the gift of salvation and it's on a table. Somebody gives you a gift, but then he says, I'm going to pay it with all my good works. Is it a gift? It's not a gift anymore. Mm -hmm. And if God said it, it's because there's something true about it. You want to go against it. God says, not a problem. Eat the consequences that are going to come after. You want to believe the book. You're going to eat the consequences of you believing the book. And what's the consequence? You getting eternal life. He that hath the Son hath life, but he that does not have the Son does not have life, but the wrath of God abides on him. God loved you so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for your sins. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ called you his friend while you were spitting in his face with all the dirty jokes about God and Jesus Christ and everything else with it. And he still called you his friend. You decide if you go to heaven, I accept the gift of eternal life. Or you say, I reject. What did you just do? You just put yourself in hell. You just wrote yourself the ticket says, you know what? I'll see you later. And how many people say, I'm gonna have fun in hell. Hell is an ugly place. I used to say, I go to hell. I don't say that anymore to people. I don't want my worst enemy to go there for how terrible it is. But there's enough information in the Bible that actually explains what hell is all about. And hell, by the way, again, is just a waiting room. Your final abode is gonna be in the lake of fire found in Revelation chapter 20. At the judgment, you're there alone. Your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle, and the plumber mm. will not be there. So in the end, who throws you in hell? You actually did it yourself. So don't go blaming God. The decision to walk with Jesus Christ, to believe in His death, burial, and resurrection, like Paul mentions in Romans chapter 9, verse 10, is something that you do now that you're alive, not after you're dead. Because after you're dead, that you're actually in hell, then you're going to be an automatic believer. Either you bow your knee now and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, or you are going to bow your knee and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord on the other side, just before you're going to end up in your eternal abode. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and the things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. That means everything is going to be bowing their knee at Jesus Christ. So I'm telling you now, you will be bowing your knee to Jesus Christ, either in this life for eternal life, or in the life to come for eternal life, but in hell, instead of being in His presence. This is a choice that you have to make.